Hello and welcome to Curated Spaces, the podcast that explores the stories behind spaces reimagining how we stay, work and play. Join me, Molly Cooper, as I sit down with founders, owners and thought leaders to hear about their journey of bringing a space to life. Great spaces shape our lives. They inspire, nurture and connect us. But most importantly, they bring us together to share life's milestones with the people who mean the most to us. So whether you're a traveller, foodie or design seeker, join us as we celebrate the power of spaces and the brilliant people behind them. Today I'm in the depths of South West Wales, a land of Welsh folklore, abandoned castles and stormy seas at the Grove of Narbeth. Once an old longhouse had fallen into disrepair, this building has been brought back to life with crackling log fires, cosy corners and incredible food straight from the kitchen garden. I'm delighted to introduce Neil, who along with his wife Zoe saw the potential in this dilapidated building and embarked on painstakingly restoring the hotel in what can only be described as a real labour of love. Neil, I can't wait to hear more about this journey of yours. Welcome to Creative Spaces. How are you today? I'm great. I'm really pleased that you've made the journey out to South West Wales to Pembrokeshire. Well, I'm delighted to be here. What a gorgeous spot of the world. Worth the four hour drive from London. <laughs> it's a straight drive though. You know what it is. You just get on one road and you just one keep road. on going. <laughs> I always say to people, if you're in the centre of London, um, literally once you get on the A4, there are only three tenants to the Grove Gates. And you're not wrong, actually, I'm thinking about it. That's right. Well, Single road all the way to Narbeth and then a few turn-ins and you're here at the Grove. Anyway, well, perfect. Well, let's tell our listeners a little bit more about where we are in the world, this gorgeous pocket of Wales. Can you help set the scene and paint a picture for people listening? Well, the Grove is, um, we're sat right in the middle of Pembrokeshire. Mm. We're sat beautifully in a, a little quiet glade. Uh, it's in a hollow um, overlooking the Narbeth Hills and we have the Broselli mountains in the distance mm. and that forms our horizon here from the hotel we have narbeth a little market town just on our doorstep and you can see that on a hillside to the right hand side of the hotel here mm. as well um Pembrokeshire is uh, is famous for its coastline so a lot of the people who visit our hotel uh, come here to explore the coastline mm. um it's a coastal national park it's the only coastal national park yeah. in europe and um it's famous for its beaches, rugged coastline and uh, beautiful harbours. Uh, so it is, it is a beautiful place to visit and uh, uh, being placed right in the centre of the, of the county here in Narbeth means that we're really, everything is accessible, whether you visit mm -hmm. the, the, the more rugged north coast or the softer sort of uh, southern uh, stretch of coastline with a lot more sandy beaches. Yes. And, um, and it's popular with holiday makers, uh, it's a great place to come. Absolutely. And when the sun shines today, you can see for miles those hills in the background. It's just gorgeous. Now, before we get into the space itself, I'd love to hear a bit about your background and how come you've ended up here um, in Pembrokeshire. Gosh, that's a long story. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I started my career in engineering, so I'm a structural engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked for a practice, consultancy practice called Atkins, they're still around, I think. As a bridge engineer in their design team in Swansea, yeah. um, so I have a few bridges to my name. <laughs> in fact, that. you've crossed and you've gone over and under some of my bridges on your route to oh, West wow. Wales and to see us. Um, <laughs> quite, it's quite nice that I, I, I use those same bri those same yeah. bridges on my journeys, you know, back and forth to Pembrokeshire. Um, quite proud of going into engineering and doing that. So after my years in steel and concrete, I went. Um, I decided to do a second degree in business. And ended up in uh, management consultancy in London in the Big mm -hmm. Smoke, and um, uh, a strategy change and ultimately program delivery was really mm -hmm. my bag. Yeah, uh, and somehow now I've ended up here. I suppose I like a project. I think I'm, I've, all, I've always liked projects. I think that's my building, my build, my engineering background. And actually, consultancy is all about projects, discrete projects. So yeah. uh, certainly, how we how this how growth has morphed it over the years. It's all about projects yeah. and that's really at the heart of what drives Zoe and I. And yeah, it's been, it's, it's been a, a wonderful, colourful journey mm, for sure. Very much the ultimate project, it feels like, because it isn't just Grove actually, you have a, a collection of properties and businesses out here, don't you? 
Yeah, we, well, the Grove was the starting point, and now perhaps I'll go into that. And, you know, this was just a derelict house uh, when we bought it. And we found it by mistake. We were going to buy something in Devon, actually. We were looking for a project. Um, and, um, you know, this started as it was all overgrown. It was unoccupied. There was trees growing out, some of these outbuildings that we have here. The main house, all the wind, some of the windows were shattered. Um, it was damp all the way through the bin. Mm. The valleys had failed. There was water pouring in rotten floorboards everywhere yeah. it really was in a dilapidated state mm -hmm. um so we love a project as i've already said yeah. so it, we really fell for it straight away actually um it just had we knew it had something as soon as we we set eyes on it and um and so we and i were you know it's quite a big decision you know to leave our jobs in london and come and embark on something like this it it, it was well, actually, looking back, we were probably we were slightly naive, but that naivety was really important. I think mm -hmm. we had the energy, and we had we probably we didn't know we had the skill or the drive to be able to deliver it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we we have stood up to the test, mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, um, it's been a, a mammoth journey, a mammoth task. Uh, but we've delivered something special. So from uh, uh, no ambition to run a hotel and restaurant, really, early doors, <laughs> none. <laughs> Who would want to run a restaurant and hotel? I mean, we hadn't, we didn't come from the hospitality sector, so it's yeah. not, it's, it's, it's hardly surprising that we had that. We would have been frightened, wouldn't mm, it, to yeah. think that you'd want to run a hotel and restaurant. There's no ambition to do that here. Yeah. Uh, all we wanted was, we came to Pembrokeshire for a project to uh, find the good life we wanted a cabbage patch and what we saw the potential here at the grove was to run self-catering cottages mm -hmm. um, that did morph quite quickly uh, because of the financial crisis into a better breakfast mm -hmm. as well so we just decided to support the business early doors with a bed and breakfast and i really that's really at the heart of why we are where we are today because people enjoyed our breakfasts mm -hmm. i love cooking yeah and i really we always made a big effort here yeah um we're annoyingly proactive i think is <laughs> is 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 one way you could describe us a little bit um and so our breakfasts were good and our guests give us lots of wonderful feedback and they encouraged us to open a restaurant mm -hmm. we opened a restaurant and it went really well um and today the grove is not four bedrooms um and there are no self-catering cottages anymore. Uh, we're 25 bedrooms. It's morphed into something a bit more significant. We have five AA Red Stars, mm. um, which puts the restaurant in, at the hotel in, as, uh, into the space of being one of the leading hotels in the UK. Mm -hmm. And we've also got four AA Rosettes in our, we've got two restaurants here actually, but in our fine dining restaurant, the Furnery, which we're very proud of. Our chef here is Douglas Baelish, is an extraordinary chef. Uh, he has four A rosettes, mm -hmm. which again puts the restaurant, that restaurant, um, you know, it really is a significant um, place to eat. Mm -hmm. And then we've also got a relaxed dining restaurant called the Aunt Sound Rooms, which is just beautiful too. Yeah. Uh, I really enjoyed showing you around that I a bit know. earlier. And it's uh, when you stand and you look here, and I couldn't believe when you told me there was the original part of the house and an extension, which just blends in so well. I just can't get my head around how you've done that. And then you have, we're in these beautiful old stone longhouses. Um, and they're what, 500 years old, you said? Um, so I'd love to understand when you got here and you were faced with two sort of crumbling longhouses, um, a house with broken windows and like you said, damp. Where did you even start to begin when you thought, okay, let's turn this into guest houses? I think I think the key thing for us was that um, that we didn't want. We, we've always been inspired by place. I think mm -hmm. that's really, really been important for us. So clearly, the house was had it grabbed Zoe and I certainly early on. It, it's it's in this glade it has a certain something about it it's higgledy piggledy here mm -hmm. as well it's not it's not too it doesn't take itself too seriously mm. this house you know it's you arrive down this windy drive you've got the views and then the house appears from somewhere it's you've got the outbuildings the masonry outbuildings and then the house itself has got you know elements of jacobian architecture and and mm. and gothic architecture about it there are different i might go into that a bit later but yeah. 
you know it it has something that is exciting mm -hmm. and inviting and that's a great start for a hospitality yeah. venue mm -hmm. uh, we felt that straight away uh, it was really important that everything we did from the start of this project respected the old house mm -hmm. so we're very very lucky to have lots of lovely architectural features um which you know and we've always tried really hard to protect those or and even uncover a mm -hmm. lot of the old features which were hidden yeah. up over the years yeah so we've we've restored lots of ingle nooks here mm -hmm. we've um we've uh, restored lots of the ceramic fireplaces the seven fireplaces we yeah. have here which are I might go into that a little bit Definitely. later and, uh, as well. But that's really been at the heart of the decision making. So the interiors that we've designed mm -hmm. here, I've again tried to have, I've always referred back to that place mm -hmm. and the history of the venue. Mm -hmm. um, there is something quite warm and caring about this place. Mm -hmm. It's not an intimidating space to come and visit. Mm -hmm. you, you almost, it welcomes you in yeah it hugs you it does it's a it's a it really has got we're talking words about a warm welsh welcome actually mm. we do talk about that maybe we talk about it too much but actually this this venue does mm. it really does that to you uh it appeals to a certain type of guest and and actually a certain type of person who works here i think and 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 you feel you feel i think you do feel the love in this building oh. Definitely. As soon as you walk in and there's that warm smell of wood smoke and the panelled walls, it's just, it's a warm Welsh welcome. Um, I'd love to go into the history of this place because I know you have some quite notable figures in your past here. I'd love to hear a little bit about them. Yeah, well, yeah, what is it? <laughs> it's a long story. Um, I mean, the rich, as you mentioned, the long house here, which is it's a very small part of the house, but, you know, of this, and it's 26 acres here. So the original building uh, or buildings uh, date back to the 14th, 15th century. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the property then was um, bought by um, the, uh, a po the Poyer family. And the Poyers are a really famous family here in Pembrokeshire mm -hmm. uh, because John Poyer, who uh, uh, is, quite, is, a, is a very famous historical figure in Wales. Okay. Um, he was a re the rebel who started that what became called the uh, Second Civil War, the uprising in Wales uh, was the senior, one of the senior military figures who started that was a gentleman called John Poyer, oh. and John Poyer owned the Grove, <laughs> which is quite extraordinary. Yeah. Um, so uh, rallying to the King's Banner really didn't end well for uh, John oh, Poyer, no. unfortunately. Um, but um, uh, his widow Elizabeth uh, was interestingly paid a pension by King Charles II. Really? So the house then was handed down to his mm. son, Daniel Poyer. Oh. And actually it was Daniel who built the main building of the Grove, as you see today. Yeah. Through marriage then, it then fell into the hands of uh, a notable sort of mm -hmm. family, wealthy local family called mm. the, Hen the Lewises of Hentland. Uh -huh. And the Lewises commissioned um, a very young architect called John Pollard Seddon yeah. uh, to create, to enlarge the property, to create mm -hmm. a gentleman's residence. Ah. Uh, John Pollard Seddon is quite an exciting figure. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a very notable sort of Gothic revivalist architect mm -hmm. of that period. Yeah. Uh, so this is the 1870s now. Yeah. Um, and uh, John Pollard Seddon was really also famous for his, his, his prolific uh, mm. designer of furniture, of ceramics, of oh. glassware, metalwork, mm -hmm. um, which actually a lot of the, his designs are inside the building. Oh. So, so what we've ended up here with is uh, part of the building which has that Jacobean, the sort of 1670s, yeah. Daniel Poyer's original building, low ceilings, mm -hmm. maybe 2.5 metre high yeah. ceilings, kind of cosy spaces, mm -hmm. um, lots of fireplaces. And then this Gothic revivalist extension, which yeah. is Seddon's work, um, and and then the much higher ceilings. Mm -hmm. um, so that it really adds to the higgledy piggledyness of the site. Mm -hmm. Really, it has it it has morphed itself yeah. uh, over the years, yeah. and and I think that's one of the reasons why the building relaxes people mm -hmm. because it isn't perfect. Yeah, it has had this interest in life mm. uh, it somehow 
wraps you up. Yeah. And I think um, a huge part of that is how you've worked with the space and you haven't just imposed a designer's vision that they did in isolation. Um, I'd love for you to share a bit about how you, you brought Martin to come and put his own twist on this beautiful building, but really, um, really staying honest and authentic to all these beautiful features and the panelling and the glass you have throughout the house. Um, you know, also Martin has a certain um, humour. Mm -hmm. um, he likes, he really appreciates whimsy. He's also a very caring chap. Mm -hmm. um, and and he likes a very unbuttoned approach to things. Mm. Uh, he's very creative. Yeah. He's extremely thoughtful in how he looks at every space. Mm -hmm. Every space, he sits in the space and thinks about it carefully. Yeah. It takes time to come up with a design concept. I think lots of those words that I've just used mm. to describe Martin is really what Zoe and I like. Mm -hmm. It's the most natural, that's what we naturally, the way we naturally think. Mm -hmm. And th that, uh, I'd also extend those words actually to something else. I also think this place is slightly bohemian. Mm. Dare I say that? I'm not sure I should say that because that makes some should. people comfortable, uncomfortable, but there is a certain, that does that is reflected in our service style a little bit and in the house itself it's the fact that it's imperfect it allows that bohemian style of that the bohemian approach that soft caring uh, relaxed service approach to thrive um and uh the other thing here is that because it's quite a creative space is that there's elements of surprise um, the word delight is probably overused in for sort of interiors a little bit. But yes, you know, those elements of delight, that surprise all the way through the building. And that is Martin's right at the heart of that creative process. Um, we hoped that, so yeah, I think we had that conversation. Yeah. It was just, it was an easy conversation because the building defined it. Mm. It's history, yeah. Seddon. The way it was, its architecture, its its journey from a mm. from the longhouse, from an old masonry farmhouse building, yeah. to to uh, this Jacobean sort of gentleman's residence was created, and then said and created something a little grander. Mm -hmm. That the the all of those layers of design that have been through the years have allowed us to have that conversation, and we hope that people go away from here with feeling that. Um, they've enjoyed a gentle level of luxury mm -hmm. and found their little place, their little bit of heaven in Wales, you know, mm. in Pembrokeshire. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think I think that's true. And I think if you look at the reviews, if you look at how uh, journalists talk about it, or pe you know, people who, who or the people I listen to, friends of mine or industry colleagues who come and visit, I think. I think I'm pretty sure that they use lots of mm. those object adjectives that I've just. You know, talked about there. Yeah, uh, I think that's really important. Yeah, because that thread, that that consistency from the design to mm -hmm. the service standard, and to the feeling that you create, is so important in hotels. Mm. And that's where you create the magic. That that's why people will come back time and time again. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is the you know the difficult challenge that hoteliers have yeah. uh, to, to to create that it's it's very very difficult and um uh, but i i genuinely feel with that with all of these people have helped us over the years together we've created it mm -hmm. absolutely and you can't fake it there's no you know copy and pasting and buying online it comes from every little decision you make from the interior design to how you welcome people and when you walk through we were saying you enter this gorgeous old door, which we think is original and in this incredibly cozy space with the wood panelling and all the curtains. And there's no big reception desk that you walk straight into. It's tucked away down a little corridor. It feels incredibly authentic and cozy. And he's done a really good job of marrying this old house into a place to stay. That was really important to us that this place never feels like a hotel. Yeah. Um, it, you're right, home from home is overly used and so we don't want that either, but um, 
quite famously, we opened this place with no keys. Really? We had no keys for the doors. Um, there's never been any signage here. We don't have signage in rooms. Mm. Um, the, the, none of that exists. We don't have menus on tables, mm. you know. None of that exists yeah. here. We, we really, it's really important that, um, y that you feel like you're coming to a friend's home, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, and 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 it, it, it's in a friend's home where you can best enjoy yourself, really, isn't it? Yeah. And that's really the kind of atmosphere we're trying to create. Yeah. Uh, that hallway that you refer to really does. It's the perfect welcome, isn't mm. it? The door itself, I think it's the original door. It's got the gothic trefoils on the in the woodwork. Uh, you walk into the space. We've wrapped the door, which is a drafty door. We've wrapped it for yeah. a reason. There's heavy, big, heavy. Yeah um curtains um the surround the door with a very traditional arts and crafts pattern mm. on those as well yeah. so it's quite traditional and then you walk into the space that martin's created mm. and the first thing that you see is this beautiful painted um wooden table that's been modified mm -hmm. by the design team yeah. and they've wrapped it in papier-mâché and vines to create yeah. the vines they've wrapped it in vines yeah. effectively with wire and papier-mâché mm -hmm. um, and then we have Amelia has created our our florist our just gardener who creates yeah. those beautiful flower displays mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a very fitting start to your arrival I think the table is slightly whimsical mm -hmm. it's, it, it's not trying to be too much. Yeah, no. And I think the whole house, that's really important. Mm -hmm. Set in the scene from the very start. Yeah. Uh, and we just want to delight you mm -hmm. and make you feel relaxed. Yeah. And, and that's the perfect start. It absolutely does. And it feels very romantic. All the hangings on the walls and even the snug blue room with the wooden panelling and just all these little Welsh wooden spoons hanging on the walls. I love how we, uh, Martin's really lent on these Welsh influences to really in embody this place in Wales. So well, I love the panelled room you refer to. It's, mm -hmm. um, um, it's, it's uh, I, I think I've already referred to the Jacobean part of the building yeah. uh, so the ceilings are quite low so it's cozy mm -hmm. it's got um, Victorian grained panelling mm. um, and it's full of blues and navies yeah. um, and then Martin has quite cleverly um, used sort of local pottery and mustards and oranges mm. uh, to punctuate the room yeah. simple pottery um, mm -hmm. and some of that is hanging from the walls as well I think you've referred to the, the love spoons. Actually, the problem, we had a problem in this room. This is, this is really interesting with Martin, actually. I think, you know, sometimes it's important that the place is not perfect. Mm -hmm. And this room isn't perfect. It's actually, the panelling, it has moved over the years and there's cracks and there's, you know, there's flaws in it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it, rather than hide it, and a lot of designers would just want to hide those imperfections. Uh, Martin l loves, embraces the impression yeah. and, and, and lets it become part of the room. And that's really important, I think, uh, in relaxing people as well. It feels mm. a bit more authentic, I think, if you can achieve that. Hard thing to get right. Uh, Martin's used the love spoons. Mm -hmm. So all he's done is just use little pins into those cracks. And then he's delicately yeah. placed beautiful love spoons yeah. on each of those cracks in each of those panels and the impact is just beautiful very romantic space mm -hmm. to relax at the end of dinner uh, or on a winter's night mm -hmm. it is really a beautiful place to be a lovely ornate fireplace a seven fireplace the ceramics in that fireplace are all mm -hmm. set in work and uh, so it really has some presence you know quietly um, beautiful yeah and what i really loved in that room you showed me um the ceramic I don't know, pot that I think he picked up somewhere at a charity shop or something. And it just looks so at home. And as we walked around, every piece of furniture had a story. It was an old kitchen table that had been made into a coffee table or the lamps that had been, you know, saved from being chucked into a tip. And I love how everything has been so carefully chosen and brought back to life and just looks so at home in this place. I think, again, that little piece of pottery that you refer to, and it almost looks like a, I mean, it, 
it looks like a, 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 a very young person's first attempt at pottery. Actually, okay. it could be that you know, mm-hmm. but it has mm-hmm. some it has some artistic merit. Actually, if you look at it, yeah. it does really look something. It grabs. It's interesting. You mm-hmm. want to look at it, yeah. and he's obviously it's chimed with Martin. He's mm-hmm. bought that piece of simple pottery, yeah. and it's a centerpiece. Yeah, and it 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 it, it doesn't have to be. Um, an exclusive piece of pottery. Mm-hmm. It, something as humble as that yeah. uh, can be the centerpiece of a room in Martin's world, mm-hmm. and really that does fit this house, and it certainly fits Zoe and I. Uh, there's a lot of upcycled furniture all over the house. You, I know uh, we use you know uh, a recycled sort of um, no. Um, uh, lights and we've modified mm. them ourselves. Yeah. You know, we've stitched antique blankets onto the backs of sofas. We've um, we've very been very very creative. You know, we've used antiques of the quilts, watch quilts, uh, patterned quilts, um, patchwork quilts. Mm-hmm. Sorry, yeah. um, across the property as well and lace and things uh, hanging from walls. And it really does give the house something quite special. I think it really does. Um, and so let's talk about food because I think. When you think of Grove, you think of the food, this amazing restaurant, the fernery, but you obviously have the casual dining as well. Can you tell us a bit about your transition from B&B to bringing these incredible restaurants with you know the highest accolades to life here in Marbeth? Yeah, that's a long story. Yeah, that. <laughs> set, set I mean, what I would, I, you know, um, it's not hard to be inspired. I've been mean, going back to the idea of being inspired by location, which is, you know, uh, really, we're in this amazing natural location with these hills in front of us. Um, so it's all, like, all agricultural land. We're surrounded mm-hmm. by agricultural land. Uh, so the produce that comes from Pembrokeshire, the land, the, 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 li- the livestock we have here, um, uh, where we've got this beautiful coastline and so the fishermen, the local fishermen, mm-hmm. uh, we get a lot, a lot of line caught fish here, yeah. crab, lobster, we even have Femmeshire oysters now mm-hmm. um, they are being cultivated out on the west, in, on the, on the, on the, on the wow. Atlantic coast there. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not difficult to be inspired mm-hmm. by what's been produced locally um, and we were inspired and what we've done is created several acres of kitchen gardens here mm-hmm. so uh, i enjoyed walking you around yeah. the kitchen gardens earlier uh, we, we, you can see the level of effort that we mm-hmm. go to here um, uh, so we do produce most of our vegetables into mm-hmm. for our for our restaurants um, we have two restaurants here i've already referred to them um, our gardeners and kitchen team have quite a symbiotic relationship it's really important that they mm-hmm. have a really close relationship um, and we just bring all that produce together onto the table um, and you know it's it's I think people people do I'm, I've already referred to people come in here to see Pembrokeshire and a lot of people do particularly those extended stays mm-hmm. uh, but Grove is is uh, very well respected for its um, food and mm-hmm. wine mm-hmm. and so actually for those one night stays for those people we are people do come here for those special occasions mm-hmm. for those uh, to celebrate an anniversary yeah. or birthday and they might just come and dine here or they might stay and dine here so food is really at the heart of mm-hmm. the grove and it always has been and it always will be yeah. um, we, we work really hard to uh, deliver something truly special for our customers. Mm-hmm. And what I really liked was how you have this amazing restaurant, you know, with a tasting menu, but it wasn't, it didn't feel intimidating the space at all. It had the ferns on the walls and before you go in, you're, it's almost like you're in a little cosy village pub with these amazing big sort of wooden benches you found <laughs> in a slate covered bar. That's exactly just... what I wanted. Yeah. yeah. So that's Martin again. So, you know, we've already talked through some of the lounge spaces and the uh, and we really wanted a cosy space and really intimate. Mm. And that's, I, I, I like a pint of beer. Yeah, who doesn't? I like a pint of beer. And Wales is actually, Wales is not about fancy country houses. Mm. It really isn't. I mean, there are beautiful country houses in Wales, but Wales is about the pub. Mm-hmm. You know, it's about the cosy pub. And so I did want a, a space within the building that embraced that. So 
uh, Martin's quite cleverly used sort of Welsh set, blackened Welsh yeah. settles in yeah. the bar area. We've got a steel bar and we've hung the front of the bar with a purple slate, a uh, Pembrokeshire slate actually. So mm-hmm. it's far, it's uh, mined in, in, in Pembrokeshire. And um, so, and that's the roof slate that we have on the main building. Oh. So we've hung the front of the bar with that slate quite okay. effectively. Uh, we've got some beautiful Pembrokeshire photography by a gentleman called David Wilson, black and white photographer on the walls. Um, and Martin's created these little delicate lights. There's some little nod to miners' lamps mm. in the space as well. Um, it's a place where I feel comfortable having a beer. I like it. I like my parity. My chosen parity is a beer. I like yes. a, a good, a good IPA. Yeah. And so, yes, if you want to have that in that space, you can feel perfectly comfortable there. Mm-hmm. However, given Martin's impeccable styling, um, he's a very, you know, it's it's impeccable what he what he's delivered. If you want a fancy cocktail and you really feel comfortable in that space, having that drink too. Mm-hmm. So it is, it is, it's a very flexible space, really, depending on what you, um, you know, if you just want to stay there all evening and dwell and drink joy beer and drink wine, then it's it's great for that. Or just a a pre dinner drink before you go into our funerary restaurant is great. It it works both ways. It's great. Amazing. And can you sort of give us a bit of flavour about what you'll find on those tasting menus? I know you spoke about freshly caught fish. Um, and everything from the kitchen garden. So are we talking modern British or a twist on sort of European cuisine? Or... Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, it. well, gosh, it, it, I really don't try not to get involved with, you know, the, the kitchen, mm-hmm. what the kitchen deliver too much. I guide and give feedback, uh, but it, it really does come from our team. It has to come mm-hmm. from them. Yeah. Um, so you walk into this fernery restaurant mm. And clearly, we've called it the fernery, haven't we? So mm. I think uh, we've we've my, Zoe and I have pressed ferns, and we've used it as wallpaper on the walls, um, and we've planted a beautiful fernery outside the windows of the mm. of the restaurant as well, and that's gently lit in the evenings. Uh, the whole idea here is that our commitment to the local produce. Mm. Is sincere, yeah, and I think the humble wild fern really underlines that yeah. a little bit. Yeah, uh, we've decorated the tables with little glass uh, glass vases with ferns inside mm-hmm. and water. They, yeah. they, it works perfectly. Yeah. and then there's lovely central displays in the room of ferns overflowing mm. from large vases, large pots. Sorry, I should yeah. say, on um, uh, a, a sort of a live wany edge mm. table. Uh, which we serve for our, we use for our wine service. Beautiful. So as soon as you come into the space, there's a sense of the local environment, mm. the hedgerows, yeah, and that really then hopefully comes through in the, the food that comes out of the kitchen. Yeah. And it, so I don't think it's that hard to inspire a chef mm. to go and talk to our local mm. fisherman, Berno and De- Dennis, who's lives in the harbour here yeah. just one mile up the road mm. his boat is based out of Saundersfoot harbour and he's a line courts fisherman and uh, i i you know we know but i've known Bernard for Bernard Berwin for years and he's worked with lots of our mm. chefs here and he waltzes in at the end of his his day on the on the boat with his catch literally Brilliant. walks into here on his way home yeah. and drops the fish off into the restaurant amazing now you know and so his line caught sea bass is always on the menu mm-hmm. um it's um you know it's a fabulous product yeah. and uh, those are the kind of relationships that really bring the menu to mm-hmm. life yeah absolutely and i love how with the ferns and with the with the line caught sea bass and the and the veggie from the kitchen garden you take something simple humble and you just really like champion it and i love that that you really get that sense it's at the heart of everything that happens here and even in the mini bar you have the the local welsh gin i just think little touches like that are so brilliant for showing that you really care and this space is an extension of the community and where it is in the world and that yeah uh, it's really important i mean we've we've got so many great brewers now and even distillers locally and we Hemmershire just has so many good things going on. We even have the most fabulous vineyards. Mm-hmm. Belfry produces uh, some beautiful sparkling white wine. 
which is, is winning national, international awards now. Yeah, right. So, you know, the wine industry in the UK is really flourishing, isn't it? But it's really happening in Wales too. And so there's so much to be excited mm -hmm. about, whether it's, you know, the produce on our doorstep yeah. um, or even the drinks uh, that come from the, this area of Wales. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, we're shouting about it for sure. Yeah, and talking of things to be excited about, I know you've referred to this as very much a multi-stage, multi-project journey, but what's coming up? I know you've got some big plans on the horizon. Can you give us a bit of an idea about what's next for Grove of Narbeth? Gosh, um, well, clearly we've it, our business is a bit more than Grove of Narbeth yes. now, mm -hmm. so it's it's always competing uh, with our other venues because mm -hmm. uh, clearly we've been. The success we've enjoyed here has enabled us to open other restaurants and we've just purchased a beautiful hotel in Snowdonia called yeah. Penmanichav, which is mm -hmm. uh, um, taking up a lot of our time right now. Um, actually, uh, we did f 10 phases of work here, uh, construction work. Um, yes, there are planning permissions <laughs> to do more. To do more. Mm -hmm. So we haven't finished. Um, We've got to be careful about the next stages. I mean, this is a 25 bedroom venue. Um, and so any further development has to be very carefully considered. Um, we do have a plan to extend the new wing that we built here in 2012, uh, which just sorts out a few details mm -hmm. that we're not quite happy about. And it adds four more bedrooms. So mm. we're not going to create a hundred bedroom no. resort here. That's just no. not going to happen. Uh, but there is certainly, there, you know, when you are running a hotel business at this level, uh, economically it does help to have a certain center gravity of bedrooms. Mm -hmm. And whether it's always a tough decision for a hotel, yeah, particularly a country house hotel like this, is what the optimum number of bedrooms is uh, to certainly maintain the atmosphere you have in the mm -hmm. hotel and not spoil it by having too many people mm -hmm. here. And so we're going to be careful about those decisions. Yeah. Uh, but. Um, Certainly, that's the that's probably coming next. If mm -hmm. we do something like that, we do have preliminary planning permission for a spa here as oh. well. And um, given the energy costs at the moment, yeah. uh, uh, and the whole net zero uh, challenge that businesses uh, have, uh, I'm not quite sure that might be that as an easy next step mm. as we thought it might be just a few years ago. Yeah. So I think we'll be looking at the energy challenge mm -hmm. uh, first. And once we've dealt with that mm. and come up with an effective solution to achieve our net zero ambition, uh, then we can then we can relook at the spa yeah. and see if that is uh, feasible for us to deliver. I know our guests are really excited by the prospect of the spa <laughs> here. I know everybody thinks about everybody likes a spa, don't they? Yeah. But um, no, we're quite happy right now to focus the whole venue around food, mm -hmm. and um, and that would be the case now for the next for foreseeable future anyway. Very exciting. Well, Neil, it's been such a pleasure chatting. Before we do go, of course, we've got a game of dream spaces to play. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you three questions. And um, for each uh, one, you get to choose a space of your choice. Imagine you've won the lottery. Money is of no object. It can be somewhere you've been, somewhere you're dreaming of going. Um, but first up, what's the space you're running away to, escaping the hustle and the bustle, and you're having a detox? Gosh, I'm quite easily pleased to be <laughs> <laughs> and if I'm honest, you know, actually, I, you know, I'm quite happy in Pembrokeshire. And actually, if I'm honest, where do I go to to detox? I, if I'm honest, I just uh, I live in a little village called Penali. Um, uh, there's a little railway line in front of the village. I cross that railway line in any on an evening. Mm -hmm. um, I, I walk into the dunes. And that's my uh, Lynx golf course. Mm. Um, I, I've always played golf from a very young lad. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like nothing better than going out onto that golf course in the evening. Yeah. And just uh, if there's the more wind, the better. I love to love the challenge of marshalling mm -hmm. the wind um, and shaping a ball um, and just losing myself on a golf course is really the best place for me. Yeah, blow um, away those cobwebs, absolutely. Okay, so this one's slightly different. Your ultimate birthday party, where are you hosting it? Well, I had my 50th recently, what do we do? Oh, oh. I'll tell you what we did. So we, um, I, I was very lucky to live in Wimbledon actually. Uh -huh. So I, I, I like the idea of, there's a word uh, we refer to actually quite a lot. It's a Welsh word called uh, 
uh, harass, 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 harass. I've got to get that right. I might get into trouble. <laughs> Lots of people if I get that wrong. Mm-hmm. And it means, a, the word means a certain nostalgia for a, a person or a place. Uh-huh. Um, something, a place or a person that holds something in your heart. Mm. It's some, slightly really soulful. Love that. You know? yeah. Not a lovely word, yeah. right? And um, and so I think if you if I'm going to have a special celebration with it would have to be my friends mm-hmm. and um, and uh, a, a place that has a special place in my heart is is Wimbledon. Oh, um, I was lucky to live in Wimbledon for ten years. And I've got lots of dear friends who still live, some of them still live mm-hmm. there, some of them, not, lots of them now ventured out in London too. But um, for my 50th, we all teamed up in Wimbledon oh, and we got an Airbnb. We, 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 we did an Airbnb in one of those beautiful grand houses, mm. um, so sort of townhouses yeah. in Wimbledon Village. And um, we we pretended actually because we were, all of us would have loved to have lived in the village. Yeah, <laughs> lived in one of those <laughs> you cr- or a, a rather beautiful place. And so we took that house, we took it over for the weekend, and we cooked and we ate in the lo- in our all, in our old sort of stomping ground and old rest. We ate in our all our favorite restaurants yeah. and um, drunk in our favorite bars, our meeting places. We walked the common Amazing. and um, and had Sunday lunch in the Fox and Grapes out oh. on the. Perfect. Which is which is a pretty historic pub out on yeah. Come, which is if you if you've lived in the area, we all know, know it. And, yeah. and adore it so much. So yeah, I think yeah, I think yearning for a, a place that has something um, that's special mm-hmm. is really important. Absolutely. And the last one, a bucket list trip once in a lifetime. Where are you going? And are you staying Gosh. anywhere special? I've got uh, my list is long. Oh really. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there's so many places I haven't been. You know, I'd love to go to Japan. I'd love to go to mm. India. I like the idea that I haven't been to all these places. I've certainly travelled the world extensively, but I've been very lucky to do that. But I haven't been to Patagonia and Chile. I'd love mm. to go there. Uh, but the bucket list trip, I think, really for Zoe and I, would be um, you know a tour of Europe. There's so many parts of Europe that mm. I haven't been to, and. Um, and I find that really inspiring. It's right on our doorstep. So I don't have to go to all these far flung places. We've got so many, so many, so much to explore in the UK and Ireland yet yeah. as well. And the, the perfect holiday for us, the perfect bucket list trip. I love a drive. I love driving. Oh, yeah. So our dream is to have a beautiful camper van oh. and travel with our dogs, our bikes and our golf clubs. Oh, the good, the good life, the simple life. It sounds brilliant. Thank you so much, Neil, for coming on. It's been such a pleasure hearing the story behind this amazing hotel. I can't believe the work you've done to bring it to life. So thank you for sharing your story with me. Thank you for coming to see us. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Curated Spaces podcast. For more information and content around any of the spaces we feature, head to our website or Instagram. And don't forget to subscribe to have new episodes delivered straight to your inbox every Wednesday. And if there's a special place in your life that you'd like to hear on the Curated Spaces podcast, please do get in touch as we're always on the lookout for more brilliant spaces to share with the world.